Segment three, what does he mean by that? He spoke at CPAC, Conservative Political Action Conference, in February. Chris Wallace just today called you the it boy. David Brooks has said you ought to run. George Will said you have the low-key charisma of competence. I love that phrase. Um, front page here we are of the Wall Street Journal, this weekend edition. And so your old friend Robinson's been looking around the conservative web, and people are more than interested. But there are a few questions. So let me put them to you, yeah. give you a chance to answer questions folks are raising. Value added tax. At CPAC in February, you advocated flat tax, but when you spoke at the Hudson Institute in October, you quoted Hudson's founder, the remarkable intellect, a great man in my judgment, Herman Kahn, who said, this is you quoting Herman Kahn, yeah. quote, it would be most useful to redesign the tax system to discourage consumption and encourage savings and investment. One obvious possibility is a value added tax and flat income tax. Close quote. And then you added, this is your words, that might suit our current situation pretty well. Yeah. Close quote. Well, you know, I'm not for a VAT tax. I, um, I was extemporizing that night. I was making really two points. That the, um, the Hudson Institute I knew and, and loved was really famous for its contrarian thinking. And it, it, it operated on the premise that by the time everybody agrees on something, it's probably wrong. And let's go figure out why. <laughs> And I, and I was really commending the fact that way back then, he was talking about getting away, you know, down to something much flatter on the income tax, taxing consumption as opposed to work and investment and so forth. This is vintage Ronald Reagan, by right. the way. Right, it sure and is. And so, you know, I probably, trying to make that point, left an impression, I think the VAT tax is a good idea. I don't. It's unambiguous. I, you are not in favor no, of no, flat tax. No, no, of course not. Okay. Now, you know, but let me just point out sure. that a, a very flat income tax, the kind I described in that right. speech. I specifically mentioned, let's don't tax investment and um, so forth. But if you do that, it works out pretty much like a consumption tax. Right, right. Uh, just, you, just, you, just, you just call it something different. But the whole point uh, uh, I, it was to, to say that uh, on that one evening, you know, let's keep thinking. Let's keep our brains turned on. Let's see if there are some new ideas regardless of the subject matter. And um, that's all I had in mind. Okay, collective bargaining. On your first day as governor, you reversed an executive order that a Democratic predecessor had signed granting collective bargaining rights to state employees. That happened six years ago. It happened. You're on the record. And then in February, you opposed a right-to-work measure mm -hmm. that your own folks, your, the Republicans in your own legislature, were advocating. And Boy, was there consternation on conservative websites. Uh, what does Governor Daniels think he's doing? Yeah. Well, the better question is what the right to work people think they were doing. <laughs> right. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily pose a right to work bill. In fact, I've said, oh, I've been saying for years that this is something Indiana needs to look at. It does cost us jobs. We've been doing very, very well, but we... Uh, uh, because people can set up shop in Mississippi or South Carolina. Well, here's where here's an example. If you, if you, we have been working relentlessly to make our state a more pro-growth, pro-business place. And we've come to the top of everybody's ranking. Go look at any of them, Forbes, right. Fortune, Site Selection Magazine, whatever it is. And um, uh, the one uh, box we cannot check is the right to work box. When we get a competitive opportunity, when we're aware of a business who is looking around for a place to invest, and we get a, a chance to show them Indiana, our, our success record for six years is 90%. But we also know that there's about a quarter of the opportunities that won't look at us for this one reason. So I have been uh, openly you know, said that this is a legitimate stu uh, subject. But here's the problem. Um, we worked very hard with an, with an open and explicit agenda of, you would have to say, conservative change, and um, won an election. And I've been very excited about advancing, about achieving these things. Some we've talked about here, the automatic refund to taxpayers. Right. Uh, school uh, choice. The biggest uh, school choice opportunity in America, cutting the corporate income tax rate to bring in more jobs, um, a sweeping reform of criminal justice and local government and so forth. Into this very uh, uh, packed and sometimes controversial picture came, came the idea out of nowhere of a right-to-work bill. No one had campaigned on it, not the, not the legislators who brought it in, 
They had not gone to their people of their districts or the state and said, this is what we should do and why. And I said, why don't you bide your time? There's a better way, develop the case, and maybe next year. Uh, I was very afraid, tactically, of exactly what happened. This provided the pretext for our uh, Democrats to uh, repair to a hot tub in Illinois. They pulled, where, the, as, pulled as, the Wisconsin. They hit the skedaddle from the whole state. That's right. And uh, that entire agenda, which these critics you're talking about, if they were aware of it, I think they'd probably be enthusiastic about everything we were on the brink of doing. Right to work never had a chance. It probably has, by the way, their chances in Indiana have probably been reduced right. by the sudden you know, surprise uh, move that they made. And in the meantime, they have jeopardized one of the most uh, ambitious, it's fair to say, conservative agendas in the country. So it was a terrible, at best, it was a terrible bit of judgment on the part of those who plowed ahead anyway.